Good morning or good afternoon. My name is Tracy Cook and I'm with SACS Healthcare Communications. We welcome you to our webinar today. I would like to show our audience today how to send your questions, which your speaker will answer as many as possible at the end of the webinar. Our moderator today is Christina Davis. Christina is currently an adjunct professor at University of United States in San Diego, California and Aspen University in Denver, Colorado. Christina has an extensive background in GI and digestive disorders in both the treatment and diagnosis of GI and hepatic disorders. Her background includes clinical research through the NIH and FDA on infection-related topics. Christina, welcome. Good morning and good afternoon. Thank you, Tracy, for the very kind introduction. The title of today's webinar is Endoscopic Ultrasound Procedures, highlighting the important role of nurses and technicians. Speaking today on this very timely topic is Emma Townsend Rogers. Emma is currently a registered medical assistant in endoscopy and special procedures at Duke University Medical Center in Durham, North Carolina. In this role, Emma assists with diagnostic and therapeutic procedures, including endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography, endoscopic ultrasound per oral endoscopic myotomy, among others. She is very active in her professional organizations and serves as a board member for her regional chapter of GI Nurses and Associates. She regularly presents staff training at her institution. The speaker disclosed that there is no financial relationships associated with the presentation. The opinions express, expressed are the personal opinions of the speaker and do not reflect the opinions or views of our sponsor Medtronic or SACS Healthcare Communications. This activity has been approved for one contact hour for nurses. A link to obtain your certificate will be available at the end of the webinar. The accreditation statement is below and support for this activity has been provided by Medtronic. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to Emma. Thank you. Good morning. Good afternoon. Thank you for the introduction, Christina. This, today, we're going to discuss the important role of the nurses and technicians during the endoscopic ultrasound procedure. Next. Our learning objectives will be discuss the procedure by reviewing the basic anatomy, procedural equipment and preparation, the steps of the procedure and available technologies and most important best practices. We're gonna highlight the importance of the nurse and technician role when performing the procedure and common therapeutic interventions. So what is an endoscopic ultrasound? It's an advanced procedure. It allows the, for the physician and the nursing staff to visualize the structures beyond the gastrointestinal wall using high frequency ultrasound imaging. And the only way you could really do this is using an echo endoscope, or you could use a mini probe, but primarily an echo endoscope. You can do, use, excuse me, you can perform this procedure use, during the upper and lower, lower gastrointestinal tract. Some common indications is during tumor staging, diagnosis, benign conditions. So during this procedure, the layers of the GI anatomy is very important. You're gonna see first the mucosa, the deep mucosa, the submucosa, the muscularis propria, the serosa. Next, we're gonna talk about the endoscopic ultrasound equipment. Most equipment that we use will be the processor, the scopes, and the probes. And here you'll see three pictures of common equipment. The first picture is a, it's a more dated machine, but most practices still use it. The second one is the Olympus mini probe machine. It's not commonly used today, but a lot of practices still use it um, when it's available. And on the right-hand side, 
you see a more updated um, ultrasound machine. So during an endos endoscopy ultrasound procedure, you'll use the minimum of two scopes. Typically, the physician will start with the endoscopy exam, and once completed, they will ask for the echo endoscope, which is the ultrasound scope. And commonly, the scopes listed below, you'll see the standard GI scope, a therapeutic upper GI scope, which is a scope with a bigger channel, a diagnostic side viewer, or a therapeutic side viewer. So the curved linear EUS scope is a tool that is used um, when performing an FNA or FNB. It has a 120 degree field view and the working channel of this scope is typically 3.7 to 4.0, depending on who models the scope. In these scopes, if you notice to the picture on the right, there's an elevator that helps maneuver the supplies used in the working channel. And it's primarily used for lesions, lymph nodes, biopsy and pain management injection. The radio echo endoscope is primarily used for staging. They assess the GI tract and the surrounding organs, which both do, but this one is primarily used for staging. It's a smaller channel, 2.4, so that will make it hard for you to use accessories down that channel to perform any type of therapeutic intervention. And it provides a 360 degree cross-sectional view through the, through the installation of water. So air is not your friend. You will primarily see the physician suck out all the air, excuse me, suck out all the air and instill water. And that is achieved either through using a syringe or attaching the irrigation um, port to the scope. Mini probes. Over the years, this has faded um, out in use, but however, um, my practice still uses this um, mini probe. So it's used through the biopsy channel, <clears throat> excuse me, through the biopsy channel of a therapeutic upper scope or a colonoscope. It's longer than the scope of uh, the radio or the curve linear. It has a 360 radio scanning transducer and the sizes come in 12 megahertz to 30 megahertz. The mini probe is connected by inserting a mini probe in the driving unit. Once inserted, lure lock and the probe and turn the probe turns, excuse me, I said that wrong. Lure lock the probe towards the right. This was secured in place. And the physician will carry out the, proce the procedure through instilling water and the mini probe will rotate. There's special training to handle this mini probe because is so sensitive, if you drop it, it could break. A few common ultrasound char characteristics is anechoic. The structures appear in black. There's no internal echoes. You can primarily see cysts, vessels, gallbladder, ascites, and water. Hypoechoic, decreased echogenicity compared to surrounding dark gray structures. Primarily, you can see lymph nodes, tumors, masses, and what have you. Isoechoic, similar echogenicity compared to surrounding structures. You can see liver metastases and other things. <clears throat> Excuse me. Knowing these characteristics is important for nursing staff, but in all honesty, when you initially look at the procedure, you, you're just gonna see black, white, gray. And over time, as you get into, get more comfortable assisting with this procedure, you'll know the difference. 
Next, we're going to talk about the FNA, fine needle aspiration. Most of us are used to using Cook Procore needles or Cook Echo Tip. All, in all honesty, all three, all manufacturers have needles in three sizes, which is 19 gauge, 22 gauge, and 25 gauge. In recent years, we have started doing more FMBs, which is fine needle biopsy. And that primarily entails gathering more tissue. This needle you'll see is still the same three sizes, the 19, 22, and 25, but you notice the tip is a little more sharp. And here's another needle that is primarily used for FMB. Rapid on-site evaluation, the ROSE. It's the method that provides, this is when the physician has a cytopathologist come into the room during the EUS procedure while they're gathering tissue and they give them a definitive diagnosis. They pretty much are gonna tell them from a tech standpoint, do we have enough tissue or do we need more? And here's a setup I typically use. Um, this is how I set up my FNA set station. Every center is different, but I like to keep things a little neat for them when they come in. Common specimens that you would collect during the FNA procedure when you're doing a cyst drainage, you're going to look for the C, you're going to collect fluid for the CEA, the carcinoid embryonic antigen, and the amylase. If you do not get enough fluid for both, which is typically one milliliter, you would collect for the CEA because that will give you more what the results you're looking for than amylase but I will consult with the physician before um, sending it off. And how you package these, I left this out because it's according to, you check with your lab and it's according to how they want you to package it up, what container they would like for you to put it in and um, send it off. In my practice, we use a color-coded tube and a 22 gauge needle. In cytology, I put this on the slide by itself because this is what's going to give you all the goods that you need. And I say that because once you put it on the slide and you smear, when it goes back to the lab, they're going to spin this down and it's going to give you more of the information you're looking for. I call it getting down to the nitty gritty. Other specimens that may be obtained during the EUS. Is flow cytometry, which is the leukophenotype, when they're looking for lymphoma, microbiology, triglycerides, C fungus. Again, confirm with your lab where you're sending to, um, how to package this um, specimen. Endoscopic mucosal resection. A lot of times you cannot talk about EUS without touching bases on EMRs because sometimes when patients come in and they, um, the physician, they're referred to us for a nodule or something that may, that we may or may not um, remove. And so you can perform an EMR in conjunction with an EUS. Okay. Next. So one of the EMR methods is injection-assisted EMR. This is where you're going to gather your supplies, an injection needle, lifting solution, snare, clips, rock net. Lifting solutions. The lifting solution, they have so many methods um, when it comes to the lifting solution. You have so many on the market now. I will confirm with the physician 
what method they would like to use. And this, you will use electric cautery, the monopolar setting. Next, ligation assisted EMR. This technique commonly used the duet multivan system. I call it the combo kit, where you have a snare and a banding kit in one. And what the physician is going to do, they're going to go, they're going to advance the scope to where the nodule is. <clears throat> Excuse me. They may or may not lift it. However, they're going to put a band on it as if you're banding a varices. They're going to band it and then they're going to snare it off. And with this kit, you're able to advance the snare through the working channel while the banding kit is attached. So you don't have to come out and take the banding kit, um, the banding off the distal end and um, use the snare. It's all inclusive. Next, we're going to talk about the celiac plexus block and neurolysis, EUS guided. I will say, disclaimer, I will check with your nurse um, manager and make sure that you're able to perform this as a technician. Commonly, nurses do this um, procedure. So the endoscopic ultrasound guided celiac plexus blocking neurolysis is a bundle of nerves located in the front of the diaphragm, behind the stomach near the celiac artery and the abdominal aorta. So blocks and neurolysis, <clears throat> excuse me, of the celiac plexus can be used to treat intractable pain. Injections are usually performed in a single site or two injection sites. So right there, I will say, confirm with your doctor how many sites you're going to treat. Is it one or two? That will help you drop your medication. Some important points. The patient should be well hydrated and prepped. Um, the physician may order 500 milliliters of fluid bolus pre-procedure. For the celiac plexus block, it's temporary pain relief. You will use Kenalog. Um, in my practice, we use Kenalog. Celiac plexus neurolysis is refers to the permanent irreversible damage destruction to the neurons and nerve fibers of the celiac plexus and ethanol with ethanol phenol. We use 100% dehydrated alcohol. And all of this comes from the pharmacy. It should be located in your pixels. If not, I will call for it in advance so it'll be on hand. Okay, the supplies needed for this procedure, you would need to be Pivotane or Kenalog. I will confirm with the physician what we are treating and how many sites we'll be treating. Um, the celiac plexus neurolysis needle is a special needle designed by a manufacturer that is specifically used for this procedure. And what the technician typically does is gather the supplies. It's the celiac plexus needle, extension tubing, which you can use the pigtail tubing um, that is commonly used um, when starting IDs, and several sterile saline for injection. This can be pre-filled or you can get sterile bottles where <clears throat> the nurse can administer. So post-procedure, um, and I'm going to talk about here that the patient will need to have orthostatic blood pressures taken before discharge. And Emma, do you want to elaborate on that just a bit? During the post-procedure, the patient will need orthostatic blood, um, blood pressures taken before discharge um, just to make sure um, everything aligns. So this procedure is going to be perform uh, performed under um, EUS using a linear scope. Um, typically, you'll need a 22 gauge um, Cook Ultra Echo Tip needle, um, typically done after confirmation of malignancy. Um, uh, you know, depending on your facility, um, will be kind of dependent on on um, what sort of what what sort of um, device will be used. Um, but the one that they typically use has a diameter of 0.35 um, millimeters. 
Um, typically, it's backloaded into the distal tip of the 22 gauge needle, uh, sealed with a sterile bone wax to prevent um, an inadvertent loss um, while advancing the needle. Um, and then at least two to four are typically placed. Thank you, Christina. The pictures on the right show the standard preloaded um, needle. And on the top left are the preloaded, I mean, excuse me, are the self loading. And you would use sterile bone wax and a 22 gauge needle would be used. With this slide, I will stop here and turn the presentation over to our moderator, Christina. Thank you for attending. All right, um, thank you for that uh, presentation, Emma. Um, and I would like to review how to get your CE credit. Um, again, this educational activity has been approved for one contact hour. To obtain your CE credits, you're going to go to www.sackcasting.com forward slash INIT. You'll need to register at the site, complete the evaluation, and upon successful completion, you'll be able to print your certificate of completion. The archive version or the on-demand version will be available on www.initiative-patientsafety.org. An email will be sent to everyone when it's available, um, and the on-demand version will be accredited for nurses. And with that, we'll go ahead and get started with some questions. Um, so just a reminder, if you do have any questions, um, please type them into the question box. Um, okay, Emma. Um, someone from our audience would like to know, are techs able to administer medic medications during the uh, celiac plexus or neurolysis procedures? Thank you for your question. I will defer to no. And because it is a steroid um, medication, I would um, consult with your manager and physician leadership and they can draw up a delegation, but it takes extensive training to do to administer this medication. And it's just safer for the patient that the nurse does it. Okay, thank you. Um, what would be your best advice for a new nurse or a new tech trying to get into this field if they don't have any experience in this field? I would say, be a sponge. Um, most of us come into GI um, as a novice, and we come in with experience of healthcare. However, GI is any specialty is that of its own. And when training, you're absorbing so much. It's, I would speak for myself. I learned what to do, and then I learned the why behind it afterwards it's like you're told and you learn the why as the further along you um get into the specialty and it's always something new and with any specialty it's a team approach so you always have someone on your team that can help guide you in the right direction and always ask questions never feel inferior to ask questions Perfect. Okay. Um, and someone would like to know, do you have any advice for handling the tip of the mini probe? Who that mini probe. I broke a few in my day, and they cost a lot of money <laughs> to replace. <laughs> um, but when handling them, I, I handle them with a lot of finesse. And by that, I mean you're, the tip of it is the most delicate, just like the echo endoscope. It's like, um, I think it's oil or some type of liquid at the end that helps facilitate the spinning of the mini probe. So I would make sure I would look at it and confirm. But as I stated before, it takes expensive training and knowledge. It's not of walking to fly by night procedure. Okay, thank you. Um, and um, uh, do is EMR typically done at the same time as EUS, or are these typically done as separate procedures? The the EMR is done in conjunction with it. Um, so once the the physician does the endoscopy exam, they go with the endoscope. I mean, echo endoscope. Excuse me, and then they go follow 
they go back with the gastroscope or colonoscope, whatever they're using, to perform the EMR. But while they're doing the EUS, if they confirm that they want to remove it uh, via M EMR, you, as a nurse and technician, I will confirm that the pa patient has no metal, no defibrillator, so they can the um, grounding pad can be placed, and I will gather all my equipment. That way, whenever they go um, flow back to the endo um, view, you can proceed with the EMR. Perfect, thank you. Um, and have you seen good success in the patients that you guys have treated um, that have had the celiac plexus block or the neurolysis done? I would say we've had a lot of success stories from what I'm told. I don't follow the patients personally, but um, consulting with the physician staff, I've heard a lot of positive results. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Um, and can you go through, I know you briefly touched on it, the different processors that are used and what you guys use in your clinic? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Sure. Uh, do you mind just reviewing the different processors that are used and what, which, which one you guys use in your clinic? For the endoscopic ultrasound? Yeah, yeah, the, the processor device. Oh. Okay. Um, we typically use the Pentax system. We, our practice, we have Pentax, um, Olympus, and Fujinon. We're a big academic um, practice. But we, for the EUS, for, um, procedure, we use the Pentax scope. And we have a new um, EUS machine <laughs> that I am still learning. I will be transparent about that. But um, with the new machine, it allows a better in-depth view of the procedure. Oh, neat. Okay, wonderful. Um, and can you tell me a little bit about the curved EUS linear echo endoscope? I'm more familiar with the Pentax, and okay. I've heard other practices using other manufactured scopes, but I'm more familiar with Pentax, um, so that scope is more comfortable with me, to me, excuse me. Okay. Um, and I know more, you... Oh, I'm sorry? I'm sorry, I didn't mean that. No, no, I'm sorry, go ahead. That scope has, the linear scope has a four, the newer scope have a 4.0 channel, and it is able, whenever you're looking at the view and you're doing an FNA or FNB, it's, we don't use the balloon, which I know years ago was pretty popular, using the balloon at the tip of the scope. Now, you really don't have to use it. It's a physician preference. Okay, thank you. Um, and why is it typically necessary to do orthostatic blood pressures before the patient is discharged? Is this typically done on every patient? I would say it's important from a tech standpoint um, to see what the post-procedure effects are from the treatment. I'm not a nurse, so I can't answer with... Um, the other, what all the other stuff entails. I apologize. Okay, no problem. And um, do you know why the mini probes are not used as much anymore? I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to that. I just know with the high definition scope that they have now and all the technology advances, it's just easier to use a scope to get to the targeted lesion unless the lesion is further than what the scope can reach. Okay. And I know you reviewed them in your presentation, but what advice would you give someone new to learn the different ultrasound characteristics? So uh, I'll tell you a story. When I started in doing EUS, endoscopic ultrasound procedures, I'm looking at the screen and you you want to know so bad what they are looking at, what they're looking for, so I know what to grab. However, you're looking at the screen, and all you see is black, gray, white. 
and you see either a full moon or half moon at the top. That's pretty much what it is you're, you're looking at. And the more, the further along you get in your training and the more comfortable you get with doing their procedures, assisting with them, you'll know the difference with them. And I put those pictures in the presentation because it's important to kind of just become familiar with what you're looking at. You're not diagnosing and you're not doing the procedure the physician is, but it just helps the nursing staff be more proactive with their anticipation. Got it. Okay. Thank you. And would you mind um, just reviewing what the difference between the fine needle aspiration is and the fine needle biopsy, the difference between them? This has been an ongoing subject because I asked myself the same question, to be honest with you. Um, fine needle aspiration, you're getting more fluid to cells. And fine needle biopsy, you're gaining more tissue. Um, now, okay. I'm, I apologize, it sounds like a blunt answer, but... Um, no, that's okay. Sometimes there's just like two words, so no problem. <laughs> Um, and when 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 the nurse or the tech is doing or assisting with the fine needle biopsy procedure, um, what are some common challenges that um, you see happening, and what advice do you have to overcome these challenges? So I will say two methods that are commonly used when performing an FNA or FNB procedure is the slow pull or the suction method. The slow pull method is whenever the physician is advancing the needle, you're you're performing a negative pressure. It's, you're giving a negative pressure by pulling that stylet back slowly but steady, and that pulls the tissue and or and or fluid into the needle. When doing a fine needle aspiration, I mean not fine needle. Sorry about that. Suction method, you are creating another negative pressure via syringe, and it helps you aspirate more fluid. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. And do you mind, again, reviewing what the ROSE procedure is or what ROSE means? Um, it's a method that provides immediate feedback regarding cellular adequacy <clears throat> to okay. obtain. And, and during this process, when the cytopathologist come into the procedure room, they're going, they may, the physician may do three sticks and they say, oh, can we get more in blocks? Or um, may I have more slides? And sometimes you may stick to a lymph node and another site and you have separate um, blocks or separate slides because you have two different sites. And in that instance, you will use two different needles. And that cytopathologist that come into the procedure room, they're helping the physician, as I stated before, it's a team approach. They're helping the physician get a definitive diagnosis, get enough tissue. We love cells, we love tissue because we wanna help that patient the best way we know how to move on to the next course of treatment. Perfect, thank you so much. Um, and what what is the lifting solution, and or what do your physicians typically use? So the lifting solution, I'm gonna give something like a timeline. We used to use the methylene blue, sterile water, epinephrine lifting solution. Um, you mix it all up in a syringe. It's been so long, I I don't know the I don't know the <laughs> measurement. Um, <laughs> That's okay. Then we used Saline um, to lift it. Over the years, a lot of manufacturers have come up with lifting solutions that we buy. It's pre-filled syringes. Um, we've used O-Rise. No, first we used Eleview. Then we went to O-Rise. Um, and it's a new kid on the block now. Everlift. Everlift. So, mm -hmm. and so, with GI becoming more advanced and therapeutic, excuse me, and more invasive, the lifting solution is important for the physician to see because it gives the polyp a nice cushion and that's what you want to remove. 
Okay, thank you. <clears throat> and um, what medications do you use for the celiac plexus block? So for the celiac plexus block, um, we typically use Kenalog, which, which is triamcinolone. Okay. And it's for and then, pain relief. Perfect. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you there. You're fine. Um, and what medications do you use for the celiac plexus neurolysis? So we would use bupivacaine and 100% dehydrated alcohol. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, well, I think that's all the questions we have for today. Um, thank you so much. And um, with that, I'm going to pass it back over to Tracy. Thank you, Christina, and thank you, Emma, for presenting your session today. We'd also like to thank everyone for attending today's webinar. And just a few reminders, there will be a survey immediately upon the conclusion of this webinar. You will be presented with an online survey. Please keep your web browser open, and we appreciate your feedback, as well as the CE Certificate of Completion. To obtain your CE credits, please visit www.saxtesting.com slash INIT, and you can register at the site and complete your evaluation. We'd like to thank everyone for attending our webinar today, and we wish you a present, pleasant rest of the day. Thank you.